Think Forward. Think Research Channel. Medical Institute, the 2003 Holiday Lectures on Science. This year's lectures, Learning from Patients, the Science of Medicine, will be given by Dr. Bert Vogelstein, Howard Hughes Medical Institute investigator at Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine, and Dr. Huda Zogby. Howard Hughes Medical Institute Investigator at Baylor College of Medicine. The fourth lecture is titled, The Strength of Families, Solving Rett Syndrome. And now to introduce our program, the Grants Program Director of the Howard Hughes Medical Institute, Dr. Dennis Liu. Hello. In a moment, you're going to learn about a disease called Rett Syndrome. Back when I was in graduate school, Rett syndrome was sort of an obscure uh, genetic mystery. No one really understood how it worked, and um, it was a profound tragedy for the families that were affected. In fact, the disease was often mistakenly lumped together with cerebral palsy, which is a completely different disorder, of course. Um, the uh, families that were affected by this had another interesting mystery which was a mystery to researchers, only girls seemed to be affected. So I actually used this as a teaching example in my own work to point out that not everything was understood in science. And in fact, even the basic pattern of inheritance of a disorder um, was often a puzzle that needed to be worked through. Well, fortunately, Huda Zogby didn't just puzzle over this mystery. She worked for 16 long years to try and solve the mystery. And as a result, she has a really fascinating story that she's going to tell you. We're going to have another brief video to introduce her, and then to close the lectures, HHMI President Tom Check will return. I think everybody really works very hard in the lab because they love it. They love what they're doing. They love their projects. And, uh, but at the same time, everybody is interactive and is happy to help each other. We like people who are interactive because we work on big problems. So one person can't solve that big problem, whether it's neurodegeneration or Rett syndrome or the role of math one in neurodevelopment. These are projects that require teamwork on them. So we have three teams working in these areas. And that means the members of the team need to get along. So the culture is people work together very cooperatively um, and they really give input to each other and are very interactive to solve these problems. And I think the other side of the culture is the passion about these diseases is really just as strong among all the new young people that join the lab as I feel about these diseases. So that's what's really fun. I, I don't have to motivate them to be excited to do something for these disorders or these developmental questions. They come in very motivated to do so. I find science the most humbling experience because you really, you think you've learned a lot and you think you know a lot and then a new avenue will open up and you'll discover how much you really didn't know. My favorite part of my job is talking and interacting with people in my lab to see what good have we done today. Have we found something new that's really going to make a difference and then translated that or go back into the patients and tell them. So these are really two very exciting moments, being in the lab with a little progress on a day-to-day -day basis, but eventually when a big story happens that impacts a patient, we can tell them back. One of the most rewarding thing in science is the relationships you form along the way. And for me, that what I think has enriched my life tremendously, those relationships with my patients with my students, with my mentors and collaborators, and then my friends outside work who support me when things are slow or frustrating or hectic. So 
I think um, that you know it's a very enriching experience to be working in medicine and science where you make all these relationships and keep them for a very long time. Hello again. So like Bert, I was a pediatrician and a child neurologist, and during my child neurology training, I saw my first Rett syndrome patient in 1983. And it was actually seeing this patient that propelled me to pursue a career in research. And I'm going to tell you now the journey that we had to take to discover the cause of Rett syndrome. And the big emphasis in this lecture is the strength of families. The families have been crucial in moving research forward, and you'll appreciate that as we go through the talk. Rett syndrome is a childhood developmental disorder, which means these girls don't go through the developmental program as most children do. And before you look at a Rett syndrome child, I thought it would be very helpful for you to see what a child typically go through during normal development. I know many of you have seen children, been around them, but probably you've never wondered at what age can a child walk or talk or do certain specific tasks. So our first introduction is just a brief video to walk you through a normal uh, course of childhood development the first four years of life. Let's look at that. Sounds good, This is a girl, one year old, playing well with her hands. Running, oh, well. interacting, yeah. we all making see some be make believe in her play, drink drinking from a cup, now dancing, <laughs> and coloring, grooming, That's, and now doing more intricate dances. So this is what typical girls will do. And many Red syndrome girls actually start doing many of these things. And parents, of course, are joy that their girls are going through that very nice program, watching them learn those skills. But then something happens. And it differs for every girl, but somewhere between 6 to 18 months of age, these girls will stop learning new skills. And gradually will even lo lose the skills they once have acquired. And this process of losing their skills and sort of developing some unusual features happen over the course of a two to three years, which are very scary and devastating. And I thought for you to really get a good appreciation of what Red Syndrome girls look like, we're going to have you watch a video, and the video is narrated by Julia Roberts, who is passionate about this disorder. She has seen a child with this disorder and was very touched. So she narrates this video, and you're going to see different girls with Rett syndrome. Let's roll the film. I want to tell you about a developmental disorder called Rett syndrome. You may not have heard of Rett syndrome before now. Many people haven't, but it's highly likely you have encountered a person or a family who's living with it. Also, it's believed that there may be hundreds of thousands of young girls and women worldwide who have Rett syndrome, but have not yet been identified or have simply been misdiagnosed. Rett syndrome is a neurological disorder that affects girls at an early, critical stage in their body's development. The word syndrome is used to categorize a collection of particular symptoms. For Rett syndrome, the symptoms include a regression of skills leading to a loss of the ability to pick up and hold things, repetitive hand movements, seizures, teeth grinding, curvature of the spine, and breathing difficulties. Some girls have the ability to walk, however many lose this skill as the disorder progresses. Although shortened life is a possibility, individuals with Rett syndrome have been known to live into their 50s. So you've seen some of the features of Rett syndrome, and many of the girls go through that and develop most of these features, in fact. Rett syndrome affects about 1 in 10,000 girls, girls that have all these features you've seen in the film. And in the majority of these cases, the disease is spread. In 99% of these cases, it's just one child in one family. And this is what we really mean when we say sporadic. If you were to take about 100 families with a daughter with Rett syndrome and to look at their pedigree structure, about 99 of them or so will look like this, where there is 
one daughter affected with Rett syndrome and the other children are healthy. So it happens typically once in a family. And that really what made studying this disorder challenging because you just have one case, so you're really tough to get a handle on it genetically. Back in 1983, when I saw my very first patient uh, with Rett syndrome, uh, due to a wonderful report written by clinicians from Europe uh, in the Annals of Neurology, there was a description of one family, the one shown on the left, where there was a, a small family with two half-sisters affected with Rett syndrome. That was our first clue that this disease could be genetic. Then shortly after that, in our clinics, we became aware of another uh, family where there were also two half-sisters affected with Rett syndrome. So between 1983 and 1986, these really were the two families that were identified, and those were the two families that stayed with us for 10 years. And it was really based on these families that I was convinced this must be a genetic disorder. What convinced me is this very two small families and the fact that disease is always in girls. I felt there has to be a genetic explanation for that. But of course, getting at the Rett syndrome gene with very small families like this was a big challenge. And here's where the strength of families come to play. This particular family came to our attention in 1996 thanks to the mother, Maureen Woodcock, who recognized that something is unusual going on in her family. If you were to look at Maureen's family, she had a daughter, shown right here, and her name is Erica. I want you to remember the names because you're going to hear something in the next video that will become important. Erica had classic Rett syndrome. She had another daughter. Her name is Tiffany. Tiffany did not have Rett syndrome. Tiffany just had some learning disability, but she was fine. She graduated high school, and she actually married and had children herself. And this daughter, her name is Paige. You get you're going to hear about her in the next film. So what you're going to hear now is Maureen's experience when she received a terrifying call from her daughter, Tiffany. Let's roll the film. And I pick up the phone, and it's Tiffany. And the first thing she does is she asks me, Mom, what was Erica like at nine months? And I just said, why? What's wrong? because I hadn't seen Paige for a couple months. And she says, well, she's sitting up, but she's not getting into a sitting position herself. And she's not starting to crawl. And so they're a little concerned. And, and I told them that Erica had Rett syndrome, and they don't know anything about it, meaning the doctors and the therapists. So what do you know about it? What was Erica like? If he'd shot me or punched me in the stomach, I, I don't think it could have hurt as much, because that was the, the worst question I think anyone could have ever asked me. As Paige developed the familiar symptoms of hand wringing, tremors, and seizures, it became apparent to Maureen and others that Paige indeed had Rett syndrome. So as you see now, uh, it immediately became apparent that Paige also had Rett syndrome. So we have now an aunt and a niece with classic Rett syndrome. And Maureen went on the net and emailed all the doctors and said, and the families, have you seen anything like this? And was immediately willing to submit DNA for genetic study. And that has been extremely helpful, as you will see uh, when I walk you through the data. And then in 1997, the, another family was identified where were three affected girls with Rett syndrome. This family was in Brazil. Again, the family association brought them here and helped uh, researchers study them. So when you look at these four families, now perhaps you can refine your hypothesis a little bit and start asking what kind of genetic inheritance is uh, occurring in these families. And perhaps they, well, I'll walk you through what we went through. Could this be a recessive disorder? And the answer is no, because really, when you see here the two different fathers, and knowing that the disorder is happening at a rate of about one in 10,000, the odds will be extremely low that in two families, this will happen twice. Um, then we think of dominant disorders. Well, this is unlikely to be autosomal dominant, because we don't, here's a person who's really unaffected with Rett syndrome, but she does have a child that's affected with Rett syndrome. And most of these mothers seem to be asymptomatic. So that led us to think that most likely this is an X-linked dominant disorder where the mothers are probably spared because of specific reasons. 
And the reason that these mothers spared, as we will think about it in the next slide, is because the number of X chromosomes matter. As you know, in the males, we have two sex chromosomes, the X chromosome and the Y chromosome. And the X chromosome is shown as pink. And in males, every cell of the body will express all the genes from that X chromosome. That X chromosome is active in every cell of the body. In females, there are two X chromosomes. And we put them as one pink and one blue to show that one comes from the mother, one comes from the father. And if he, in females, only one of these X chromosomes is active in each of the cells. So half of the cells will express the genes from the X that comes from the father and half the one from the mother. Now, do you know why is it that we have that? Why is it that one of the X chromosome is uh, active in every cell and the other one is inactive? Any ideas? Because you just have genes from one chromosome. That's close. The, the idea here is males only have one X, and they're going to have so much of these genes expressed from the X. You can't imagine nature wanting females to have an advantage and have twice as much, right? So think of it this way, to keep things equal. Okay, so in the next video, we're going to see how does this happen? How does this uh, X chromosome inactivation happen? When does it happen, and what's the outcome of it? If we will look at the next animation, we're going to look at fertilized cells, and these cells start off in a female with two X chromosomes. The cell divides, and the embryo is getting slightly bigger, and still, each cell has both X chromosomes active. But in early embryogenesis, each cell will inactivate one of its X's, and one cell will remain with the paternal X as active, while the other one, the maternal one. And now, this process will happen at random, and you'll have almost half of the cells with the maternal X active, half with the paternal X. The embryo will continue to grow, cells divide, all the descendants of that cell. If it started with the maternal X active, all the descendants will keep the same uh, uh, X active. And you've seen this in calico cats, right? The coat color gene is on the X chromosome, and that's precisely why these cats look like this in mosaic appearance, because of the process of X chromosome inactivation. So if we were to go back now to the families with Rett syndrome, imagine now you have a mutation on one of the X chromosomes, and that mutation is causing the Rett syndrome gene. If you happen to be fortunate where the majority of your cells are expressing the genes from the healthy X chromosome, because that's the one that's active in the majority of the cells, you can see how this mother can escape the disease and will look healthy. Whereas in the daughters, if both X chromosomes are randomly inactivated and you have a mosaic that's about 50-50, you're going to get Rett syndrome. And actually, when we went back and looked at the Woodcock family, that's exactly what happened. The aunt and the niece that have the full-blown classic Rett syndrome had this mosaic pattern. Whereas Tiffany, who was healthier and just had mild learning disability, Tiffany has a small percentage of her cells, only 5% expressing the X chromosome with the Rett mutant gene as the active one, where all the rest uh, were expressing the healthy X chromosome. So this is true. Now, we've talked about the four familial cases, and you're still wondering, well, she told us the majority of Rett syndrome is sporadic disease. And do these four families have anything to do with the majority of the cases that are sporadic? And if, that, if those other cases are sporadic, are those caused by something environmental or something else? Or is it really also a genetic disease? And can, how can you have a genetic disease if it's really sporadic in every family? And if we were to look at these families, this can happen if the mutation actually happened by chance in one of the eggs or one of the sperms of either parent. So imagine that these people are healthy, but a random event happens and a mutation happens in the gene in either an egg or a sperm, and then that is the one that happens to be fertilized. You will end up with a child with Rett syndrome. So with this background, we have decided that Rett syndrome is a genetic disease, and my lab decided we're going to go and clone this gene, although we know we're limited. We have very small families. So when you have very small families, you really have to design a sort of specific strategy to get at this gene. 
And what our first strategy was, we're convinced this is X-link dominant, so we're going to focus on the X chromosome. And because the number of families is small, we're going to use an exclusion strategy. We're going to eliminate regions that these girls don't share and focus on those they share. So let's roll the next animation so that you could see what we did. We rationalize that the girl will get an X from the father and then X from her mother. And you know, X is really combined during meiosis. So you get an assortment of portions of each of the mother's X. The same will be true for the second daughter. Now we argued, since these two daughters have read, the only place the gene could be is in the regions of their X's that are shared, the same region they inherited from the mother. And regions that are different are not likely to contain this gene. So that was our idea about how we can get at the Rett syndrome gene. So we went on and began to study. The first family we have was this one family, as I mentioned to you. We looked at which regions are not shared. And the brown region shaded on the X was not shared. Then we studied the second family, and we were able to eliminate a bit more. And remember, for 10 years, that's all we had. So for 10 years, we almost eliminated two-thirds of the X, and we were searching the rest of the X for the Rett syndrome gene by looking at candidates and sequencing them. And then the Woodcock family came along and was an extreme help to us, whereby we could eliminate even more of the X chromosome. And finally, when the fourth family came along, when we looked at all the X chromosomes from all these affected girls, the only region that they all had in common that they shared uh, between them and their siblings was the very tip of the long arm of the X chromosome. So we decided this is where the gene must reside. And of course, we looked how many genes are there. And back in 1999, when we were looking, there were about 200 genes. And I am fortunate that there are many wonderful postdocs who are willing to really keep with it till they find it, until Ruthie Amir in our lab went through these genes, and upon sequencing them, she found a mutation in one of those genes, which turned out to be MECP2, and that is the Rett syndrome gene. So what is this protein? It's, what's this gene? It's a gene that encodes a methyl CPG binding protein. It's on the tip of the X, and down below is shown the protein structure. The blue and the pink are two important domains of this protein, which you're going to hear about in the next lecture, and we're going to know a little bit more about what this protein does. Of course, finding the gene enabled now diagnosis in all of these patients that were suspected to have Rett syndrome, and the first thing finding the gene affirmed to us that most of these sporadic cases do indeed have a mutation in this gene. And of course, it allows us then to embark on trying to understand the disease mechanism, which we will hear about in the next lecture. But this is one thing to remember from this story, is that here's a disease that's sporadic in the majority of the cases, but these very rare and precious families who sadly got struck by this disease more than once, when they came forward, they really helped us to discover this. And uh, hopefully you'll see the impact of this discovery in the next slide. Now we have time for questions. Yes? Um, what happens to the males who inherit the uh, dysfunctional gene? We're going to hear about them in the next uh, segment. Uh, you were very observant to notice there were some males in these pedigrees, and those were much sicker, and we'll hear about that in the next lecture. Yes? Was there a reason? Why um, it didn't show up until like 6 to 18 months? Is there a reason why it doesn't show? That's a beautiful question. Here you go. <laughs> um, th that is the, that's the reason I went into research. Because I thought, you know, it doesn't make sense. These girls are learning how to walk, how to talk, use their hands. And then they're losing this ability. And it's really not a degeneration. Their brain cells aren't dying. So why is that? And we're going to address that in the next section. Yes? Is it known what causes the mutation in the uh, specific gene, or is that not? There are over, there are hundreds of mutations that have been discovered in this gene in different uh, uh, individuals, and these mutations are all sorts of mutations. There's some where a C becomes a T, and there's some where a deletion happens within the gene. Uh, there are all sorts of rearrangements that happen within it, so they're all different kinds, and it just 
it's a gene that's probably a little bit more vulnerable for mutation maybe than other regions. We don't know that, but we don't understand why. Um, you said that the two X chromosomes, they're randomly represented in different mm -hmm. cells in the body. Is, it, would the cell, is the cell not able to tell that one of the X chromosomes is mutated and could then decide not to represent that one? Or is there no way for that? That is a very good question. So the question is, why doesn't the cell that recognize there's a mutation on this X chromosome let's inactivate it in all the cells? That doesn't happen at the level of the inactivation. But what happens, if the mutation is severe enough, so that it really compromises the function of the cell. The cell with the healthy X chromosome early on during life will divide a lot more and most of the embryo will be made from that cell. And that actually happened for many X-linked diseases. This is a superb question. Uh, I'm George from uh, TC Williams. Um, depending on what mutation occurs in that gene, uh, are there different like, levels of severity of RETS or, um, or is it all the same? I, I think that's another excellent question. I think next time we should just have one lecture and questions and answers, because you guys ask all the questions for the next lecture, which is wonderful. Uh, that's something we're going to be talking about, and that's really an important one. And the answer is yes, it does, and we'll talk about that briefly. Um, I noticed in the earlier um, lecture, you mentioned that in some of the mice, you were able to just remove the SCA1 gene. Mm -hmm. um, I was wondering, what are the factors that are preventing us from actually removing certain genes that cause certain diseases in humans? So, uh, so how you're th but if you remove a gene in a human, you're going to cause it. So every gene has a function. Although we removed SCA1, we wanted to see, does it? does the loss of function of that protein cause ataxia? Although we didn't get ataxia, we got another problem. These mice could not learn. These mice had very big problem with their memory. So removing genes is not a good thing from, from any organism. <laughs> yes. Before we had a genetic way to recognize RETS and know exactly what gene it was, I remember that the symptoms were wringing hands and tremors and um, how does one recognize where one disease ends and where the other one starts, like the difference between the neurologic diseases? Yes, that you're asking another very important question. Here goes the camera. <laughs> uh, ba basically, what you're asking, relying on clinical phenotype is a dangerous thing because you're right. You might see a girl that's have, that has tremors, and that girl actually might be an early... A patient with an ataxia. You know, how do you know that this tremor is from red not, rather than from an ataxia? The hand wringing, I have to admit, that's very unique to red syndrome, and that's something really very special for this disease. So once you see that, you're pretty much confident this is what you're seeing. However, some of the other symptoms, no, they're not. Seizures, mental retardation, autism, tremors, they're not. And that's why many of these girls are misdiagnosed. And it Still, we have this test. That's exactly why it's an advantage to have the gene. We can now move on and study these patients. OK, we have to move on to the second part. So let's try to understand what does this protein do? And what does methyl CPG mean? So I told you this is a protein that is, that is called methyl CPG binding protein. And you must be wondering, what on earth is CPG? CPG is a cytosine followed by guanine, and typically when that happens often, that cytosine can be methylated. And when it's methylated, as you can see on this slide, the, this protein, methyl CPG binding protein, can bind. And now the significance of the color coding of the domains on this protein will slowly become apparent. That blue domain of the protein is the specific domain that we call the methyl CPG binding domain. It binds to these methylated cytosines in the DNA uh, through this region. And now you're wondering, methyl cytosine, what does that do? And is it in our DNA? And the answer is yes, it is in our DNA. It's almost probably it's going to be a way for us to think about this almost like a fifth base. It's really a base of DNA that's very important. And you're going to appreciate why I say that if you were to look at this next slide and hear the story of what these methylated cytosines do. Methylated cytosines are present throughout of our DNA. Often we can find them 
at the beginning of the gene. And you know that at the beginning of the gene is where the regulation of the expression of this gene happens. Typically, that's where transcription factors can come and bind and uh, regulate expression of their gene. When a gene is actively expressed, as shown by this red line uh, on this cartoon, typically the DNA is open and the chromatin is open. So the way we keep the DNA open and transcription factor can access it and come and sit and induce transcription, the way that happens is by keeping acetones, uh, histones acetylated. And these little green balls are basically the acetyl group on the spiral, the histone. So when histones are acetylated, the gene is actively transcribed. Now there's these little CPG sites at the beginning, these little pink balls on a stick, is these, are these methylated cytosine. And they're there to serve a purpose because sometimes you don't want a gene to be always expressed. You want to shut it off. You want it to become quiet. How does that happen? Well, that's where this protein will come into play. Through its methyl binding domain, it will bind the cytosine. And through its pink domain, which is called the transcription repression domain, it will recruit additional protein. Among these proteins are two enzymes called HDAC1 and HDAC2. These are histone deacetylases. You notice when these histone deacetylases came close to this uh, chromatin, the acetyl group moved off, and now the chromatin is tied, transcriptive factors can't come on, and the gene is silenced. So essentially, this protein, through its methyl binding domain, will come to a site of DNA where it wants to silence this gene, and through the transcription repression domain, it deacetylates histone and silence these genes. In order for, this is an important concept to get, with, and we want you to get it, so we're going to show it all over again in this beautiful animation. Let's roll the film. So here's the gene being transcribed, and next to it you'd see acetylated histones, nice open chromatin, and now you catch these little methyl cytosines. Methyl groups is appearing, and here comes the protein. It binds, and will attract this protein complex along with the enzymes, the deacetylases, and now acetyl groups are gone, and histones become tight, chromatin closes, no transcription factors can come through, and the gene is silent. So this, what we, what we believe this protein is doing, and more and more studies are affirming that. So having, with this knowledge, let's go back now to what happens in the patients. Somebody asked me, you know, what are the phenotypes? Do the mutations matter? And we'll get to this point in this slide. When many patients with Rett syndrome had their DNA sequence, all majority, I would say, of patients with classic Rett syndrome had mutations in this gene. But then clinicians said, okay, well, my patient, I have a patient that have mental retardation and seizures, back to your question, but she doesn't have all the features of Rett syndrome. Could she have Rett syndrome? Well, it turns out some girls with just mental retardation and seizures had mutations in this gene. Some girls with just autism had mutations in this gene. And some girls with very mild mental retardation had also mutations in this gene. We even know with some normal individuals without any symptoms that had carried the mutations, like the mothers I told you about in these familial cases. So having understood the principle of X chromosome inactivation, you should not be surprised now that you're getting this broad spectrum. You can imagine if half of your cells express the X chromosome that carries the Rett syndrome mutation on it, you're going to end up with classic Rett syndrome. But if only 8 or 10% of the cells will have that uh, X chromosome as the active one and the majority have the healthy X chromosome, you'll end up with mild mental retardation or autism. And when the vast majority of the cells carry the healthy X chromosome as the active one, you even have an asymptomatic person. Of course, this asymptomatic person is at risk of having a child affected with Rett syndrome, so we cannot forget about them. Now, back to the families, one other thing that came to be very important from studying these families and paying careful attention to them is you'll now notice we're going to shift our attention to the boys in these families. In three of these families, there are boys that have a line drawn through the square that tell you these boys have died. And actually, these boys have died very early on in life. 
One of them died at six months, one of them at one year, and one of them just before his second birthday. And the reason these boys died is because they were very ill. They were born and they had very low tone in their body. They couldn't really smile or sit or walk like normal boys would do. And some of them required respiration, respirator assistance to even breathe normally. These were very sick boys. Nobody thought they had red syndrome because this doesn't look anything like red. There is no period of normal development early on here. They're very, very severe. But when we looked at their DNAs, because their sisters had Rett syndrome, it turned out that these boys did indeed have mutation in the same gene. So that will tell you, if a mutation is severe enough to cause classic Rett syndrome in a girl, it's causing the severe phenotype in boys. And this is a summary of what we've learned from the boys. Remember, the boy has a single X chromosome. So if a boy carries a mutation that inactivates the protein, like the one shown on the second line, where a big domain of this protein is gone, this boy will be very sick and this boy will die in the very first year of life. He doesn't have another X chromosome that's active in some of his cells. If this boy has a mutation that truncates the protein but keeps at least the two key domains intact, there are a bunch of boys like this and these boys have mental retardation, seizures, tremors, and balance problems. So they will live, and those boys actually, some of them are 40 years old, and they are in families that have multiple affected boys. So we call this X-linked mental retardation. And even if this, there are some boys that have a very mild mutation, one that just simply changes one amino acid, keeps everything in the protein present, but the subtle change in the amino acid is enough to affect the binding of this protein. Maybe the protein binds, but not as well, not to all regions of the DNA. These boys have presented with yet another class of disorders, bipolar disease. There is a family with multiple boys affected with bipolar disease, as well as tremors and mental retardation. So what you see here is, again, having now this gene in hand and looking at the spectrum of phenotypes you can see with this gene, you can see a broad spectrum in girls, mostly because of X chromosome inactivation, and a broad spectrum in boys, mostly because of the type of mutation. So that has instructed a lot of clinicians, and this now tells us that the prevalence of the mutations in this is probably much higher than the estimated prevalence of Rett syndrome, of which is 1 in 10,000. And this is really important for you to remember, because back to the same idea, whether it's in cancer or neurologic diseases, you start with a very rare disease, but this rare disease can teach you about a broader class of diseases that affect many, many people in the population. <laughs> Now let's go through another question that was asked by the audience. These girls start off normally. They learn how to do things and they go on for a few months, maybe a year, maybe a year and a half, and then they have problems. Why is that? What does it, why does it take 18 months to get symptoms of this disease? Well, we thought, now that we know what the protein is, maybe one way we can begin to understand that is see where is this protein in the brain and when does it uh, come on in the brain? And is that important? Does that parallel human brain development? We know that human brain development continues after birth. We always knew that it continues up to six years of age, four to six years of age. So we wanted to see, is there a relationship between when this protein is on in the cells and when brain development is taking place? And we started very early on. We wanted to look the earliest time point we can detect this brain, uh, protein in neurons. And the earliest time point we'll look at when the first brain begins to develop is 10 weeks human fetal gestation. And at that time point, if you were to look at a human brain, what you really see is a tube, that's your spinal cord, and a little bit of the brain stem that's just above the spinal cord. That's the place that first developed. Because imagine as a fetus and an embryo, you're putting the breathing machinery. That's the most important thing to do. And the spinal cord is critical early on in development. And the next portion of the brain to develop is the very superficial portion of the brain, where there are the earliest neurons. They're called the pioneer neurons. These are the sites where we're finding this protein. These red dots is when we first detect this protein. We find it in these very early maturing neurons. Now, if we were to look at the second time point in development, that's 19 weeks, now we see it in slightly more neurons. We're beginning to see it in the developing cerebellum. We're beginning to see it in parts of the brain that control 
the smoothness of movement, and we're starting to see it in the deep part of the cortex where the second class of neurons to mature is the deep layer of the cerebral cortex. And if we were to look at 26 weeks, even more neurons uh, now are maturing, so more neurons are positive for this protein. And 35 weeks of age, even more neurons are positive. We see now almost a uh, high density of neurons in the cerebral cortex and in the cerebellum. What this is telling us, the minute a neuron matures, this protein comes on. So there's a relationship in between neuronal maturation during development and when this protein is detected within the neurons. The big surprise came is as we went postnatally and kept looking at brain sections, we found that the number of neurons that become positive for this protein continues to increase up to 10 years of age. This was a very, really interesting uh, discovery because for one, it told us that there are neurons that are changing in, during childhood all the way up to 10 years of age. That tells you really neuronal maturation isn't done by four or five or six years. But it also told us that this protein continues to increase in its levels, which means there is a relationship between maturation and when this protein is needed all the way through that process. But at the same time, it sort of provided us with an insight. Why is it that we take a long time to see the phenotype? Because really early on, it is not very essential because many of the neurons don't have it yet. And it takes a while till quite a few neurons are dependent on it. And that's most likely why it takes such a long time to see the phenotypic features. So now that we know where this protein is expressed and we know every way you mutate it, you might get a neurological phenotype, a developmental neurological phenotype. We want to understand why. Why is it when you lose part or all of the activity of this protein, you get this disease? And how do you study the pathogenesis of Rett syndrome? I'm sure that by now you appreciate that mouse is a valuable model in our laboratory. They're uh, quite close to us in many ways, and they have a nervous system that we can study and understand in a way that we study our own. So in our lab, we decided to make a mouse model for this disease, but having seen the big spectrum of phenotypes that we see with this disease, choosing the mutation was critical. Because we wanted a mutation that causes classic Rett syndrome in females, but at the same time, we wanted one that will give us viable males. We didn't want it to be severe enough to kill all the males where we're forced to study them in the female and then be uh, facing the issue of X chromosome inactivation and the variability in the female mice from X inactivation. So what we picked is a truncating mutation. We engineered a mutation that preserved the two domains of the protein, but it happens right at an amino acid where we know there are many female patients that have deletions in that region and beyond that have class secret. And we hope that by preserving the two domains, the male mice will be viable. And this is what happened. We made these mice and we looked at the male mice. And as you could see from uh, this chart, that many of the features we see in the human patient were present in these mice. These mice looked normal the first four to five weeks of life. We couldn't tell anything is wrong with them, which we would predict based on where we see this protein is expressed, when and where. Then they develop tremors, they become spastic, they become hypoactive, they get seizures, they get ataxia. We even were quite surprised to see that they get the same, this classic hand movement that we see in the humans is replicated in these mice with their forepaws, and you're going to see that in a minute. We also started probing the social behavior. We knew the autistic features are present in red girls. We wanted to see, do these mice interact socially uh, well? And the answer is no. They have social behavior abnormalities. And they had abnormal curved spine like we see in the girls. So in the next videotapes, you're going to see two videos. The first one, we're going to show you that these mice do have problems with their balance. And uh, the second video will look at the paw movements. Let's look at the balance video. So I'm sure you can appreciate this mouse is also having difficulty. And this is typical of the mouse that fell of most of the red mice. 
Now, the next animation, you're going to first see a healthy mouse and see how it keeps its paw separated normally. Let's roll the film. So this mouse is a healthy mouse, and you can tell it's really trying to get out of the hand of the handlers. It's just curving up, trying to get out. And this is the red model mouse. You can see that it's constantly bringing its four paws and keeping them together. It's not trying to actually fight the hand, but it's just very often bringing its paws. And every mouse does this. We pretty, pretty much can tell which, when we have a bunch of uh, mice born, we just pick them up at about five to six weeks, and we can see all those that have the mutant gene will ring their four paws. Now, in addition to these, studying the mouse model taught us at, about another phenotype that really we did not maybe catch as well in the patients, and that's um, an anxiety phenotype that we've seen in these animals. So you might wonder, how can you tell if a mouse is anxious? Do you interview them and you see that you're making them nervous? How do you do it? Well, there are some tasks that you can do. And this is one of, there are several tasks we can do. I'm just going to show you one of them. This is one such test. It's called the open field test. And what you do, you put the mouse in a big open space. And the mouse doesn't like this. It doesn't like being in the limelight. It doesn't like all the attention. So what happens when you do this, the first 10 minutes, the mouse will go to the periphery of the space and will just hang around the walls, trying to hide away, doesn't want to see anybody, very worried about what might happen and if uh, the mouse is noticed. But after uh, 10 minutes, it starts saying there's no danger in this room. This is not a hostile environment. So it starts venturing into the middle of the open space, and it feels comfortable, nothing is alarming, so its anxiety will go down, and now we'll spend a lot more time in the center of this open space. And this is what happens with a healthy mouse. The red mouse, unfortunately, doesn't reach that level of calm and will stay at the periphery because it's anxious. And we can do additional tests, and we can confirm that what we're observing here is actually due to anxiety and nothing else. So this is something we learned from studying the mouse model. Then we went back to the parents and said, do these girls show any anxiety? And it turned out that the answer is yes, that if you walk in a room, you do tend to make them more anxious, or if you see some, meet somebody new, that indeed happens. The other thing we can do now that we have a mouse model is we know that this is what we think this protein is doing. It's binding these methylated cytosines, keep it chromatin tight, genes silence when they're supposed to be silenced. So perhaps when this protein is mutated, some genes cannot be silenced. And the answer is, which are these genes and how can we find them? By having a mouse model that you can study from the very early onset of the disease rather than very late, you can answer these questions, and that's what we're beginning to do. So how do you do that? How you can find which genes may be regulated by uh, this protein? The way you do it, you can isolate RNA from the red mouse, because when genes are transcribed, they make the RNA. And you can collect that RNA and make cDNA from it, and you can label that cDNA with a red dye. And then you can do the same for a healthy mouse, but now you label it with a different dye, a green dye. And you can put both of these probes on a slide that, or a chip that has multiple genes throughout uh, the genome that are expressed from everywhere. And typically, we uh, look at the brain in this case. And you want to see which genes have similar levels and which ones have different levels. If the amount of RNA made in the red mouse equal to the amount of RNA made in the healthy mouse, green and red together, when they're at equal intensity, they're going to give you a yellow. So you're going to see a similar amount of these genes being transcribed. But if there is a gene that's more abundant in the red mouse, that's not being silenced effectively in the red mouse, what you're going to see that the level of the RNA is higher, and that's going to look like red. Of course, as the disease progresses, some genes will be misregulated as downstream effects. So you'll, you'll also sometimes find some green ones because some genes are lower in the mutants than the wild type. So having that in hand, then, we can now begin to ask in different brain regions, even at a single neuron level, 
which genes are misregulated in the rat mouse, and why is it important to get at these genes? It is important because you know now the whole phenotypic spectrum of Rett syndrome. So if you get a handle at some of these genes, you're going to gain insight about autism, seizures, mental uh, retardation, and many of the fe features that we see in Rett syndrome. So I'm sure you can appreciate from having followed this story not only the strength of the families, but the strength of the discovery, what will allow us to do in the future. We've gone from studying a very rare disease to now learning about a broad spectrum of human developmental disorders that we will hope to continue to learn on from studying the genes that are regulated by this protein. From a practical point of view, having discovered that anxiety is a phenotype of this syndrome when this protein loses its function, and having a, m a model that displays this anxiety, we can now treat these animals with anxiety-reducing drug and see, does that help? Would that decrease their tremor? Would that decrease their forepaw ringing? And could it maybe enhance their function? We hope to do that in the mice, and if that really works, we hope to carry that then uh, to the patient in clinical trials. So this is the story of Rett syndrome, and you've heard earlier the story of SCA1. And in closing, I'd just first like to thank all the families and the patients that have helped us along the way. This, their effort has been amazing, and I'm sure you can appreciate that from having heard both stories. And uh, they continue to help us anytime we really uh, have questions. And we hope to bring something back to them. And finally, nothing in the lab happens by one person. It's, it takes a whole group of people to do that. And I'm fortunate that throughout the years, we've always had outstanding students and fellows and technicians who've helped along the way. And I'm very grateful to them. Thank you. We can now take questions. explained that the, the protein um, is used to silence certain genes which are being expressed. Why is it that this protein is not needed until neurons are fully matured? Right. So it, we think there are many other proteins, some of them from the same family that contain this methyl CPG binding domain. So there are probably other proteins that may be needed earlier. But what we think is when a neuron matures, it's now responding to activity. You know, this neuron is mature, now it can perform its function. And once an activity happens, this neuron has to turn on gene expression to accommodate that activity, whether it's learning or whatever task the organism is doing. And when that is done, now it has to, that particular gene that's responsible for that has to be quieted, and we think this protein is important for that. When the organism is now doing a lot of activity that may require fine tuning, this is when this protein comes into play. And that's, you can imagine, a child first, they sit around, they're watching, and they're learning few things, but somewhere between six to 18 months of age, you can see how much this child has to learn more now and do so many simultaneous activity. And maybe this fine tuning is important and it's done by this protein. Yes? Um, if someone with a sporadic case of Rett syndrome uh, just has a very mild case caused by, say, a slight mutation, if they then have children, will their children uh, tend to have a greater, uh, uh, will they exhibit more symptoms, will they have more mutations, or will it just continue right. to be very mild? Excellent question. So if, if a, an individual had a sporadic mutation and they presented, let's say, with mild learning disability or mild le mental retardation, that female, if she was to get pregnant, with every pregnancy, she has a 50-50 chance passing on the Rett syndrome mutation, right? Because one of her X chromosome might do that. Now, once that gene is passed on, that child <coughs> we cannot predict what their phenotype might be. It could be as great as being totally asymptomatic if that child was fortunate to inactivate or to have the cells that with the act, healthy X active survive. But that child could have the random process and end up with classic RET. So we cannot usually predict what the phenotype is going to be. It's rare to be worse because to be worse, that means the cells with the mutant allele have to have the selective advantage to survive, and we haven't seen that. 
Uh, hi, I'm Jamie from St. Albans. Um, so you found the gene and the mechanisms responsible for Rett syndrome, um, and you've linked that to other neurodevelopmental disorders. Um, how, off do you, uh, how far off do you believe you are from applying this to improving the condition in humans? Wonderful question, and it's the one that keeps me up at night sometimes. Um, so as you can appreciate, this is a very complex disease. And that's exactly my point about science is a humbling experience, because you think you found the gene, you have a protein, you're going to go after doing something about it, you're going to make the disease better. But then you're humbled because you discover this is probably going to regulate many, many proteins and many, many gene functions. So it's probably taking many changes throughout the nervous system that's giving you this phenotype. And what we decided we're going to do is really try to dissect these as much as possible, reduce them all to some unique problem, whether it's in the cerebellum, whether it's in the uh, brainstem, whether it's in the cortex, and try to find out what are the targets in these speci specialized cells and work our way that way. And we might discover it's going to take a, a, a cocktail of treatments. It might take an anxiety-reducing drug, a seizure-reducing drug, a behavioral intervention. We don't know yet. So I'm optimistic that hopefully within my lifespan we can do something for these girls, but I cannot tell you exactly when. You mentioned the green genes on the slide representing the red uh, genotype and the regular genotype. Would that, um, the showing up of the green genes have to do with the MECP2 uh, maybe turning off genes that are expected to perform certain functions? Right. So normally we think of MECP2 as a repressor, as a silencer of genes. So we would expect maybe its direct targets to be up, so those will show up at red. But imagine if you have a gene that's not turned off, that's always on, and if that one sometimes might repress or do something to another gene, the downstream effects could give you these green genes. We can't rule out the possibility that it might normally activate some genes, but we think those green downstream are downstream effects. Okay, thank you very much, and the last two are for grabs. <laughs> I'd like to thank everyone for this great holiday lecture series, uh, the production team, the students in the audience here for their terrific questions, and especially our two speakers, Dr. Bert Vogelstein and Dr. Huda Zogby. Uh, clearly, it takes a lot of patience to do this sort of work. Before we close, I'd like to announce our topic for next year, the 2004 Holiday Lectures on Science. From worms to humans, feeding is an important behavior in animals, maybe especially during the holiday season. In our next series, HHMI investigators Corey Bargman from San Francisco and Jeff Friedman from New York will explore the behavior, physiology, and genetics of feeding, weight control, and obesity. We hope to see you then. And now, from all of us here at the Howard Hughes Medical Institute, have a happy holiday season and a healthy new year.